Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the producer, director, everything of this film, Perry Peltz, who's gonna moderate tonight. And it's my great pleasure to also introduce you to um, the woman that's responsible for putting together the catalog that you received tonight. Where is Megan? Is it Megan? Where is she? Where is she? Right there. Okay, come on up. And the spectacular producer of the Tribeca Film Festival and founder of that, Jane Rosenthal. And I don't think he needs much introduction, so I'm just going to introduce you and welcome to Mr. Robert De Niro. So much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to the Aspen Ideas Festival for having us here. It's a real pleasure and a real privilege for us to be able to screen this film here. And thank you to everybody for coming tonight. I know you had a couple of choices of things you could do here <laughs> in Aspen, so we're really excited that you're here, and we hope that you enjoyed our film. I'm not going to introduce everybody. I think Kitty took care of that, um, but welcome, everybody. And I'm going to start with, with Bob as soon as he gets as soon as he gets mic'd. And by the way, I'm just going to ask one round of questions, and then I'm going to open it up and let you guys all ask questions um, of our panelists. Okay? So Bob, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think that one of the things that people don't know necessarily about this film is it wasn't when we started it. It was not intended to be broadcast. It was actually going to be something that was going to be for Bob's family archives. And it kind of grew from there. And we could talk a little bit about that. But Bob, I'm curious a little bit about the process that went on in your mind about taking where that came, that all of a sudden we, we made that shift, and you made that shift in realizing it was something that was a bigger story. Well, I originally just wanted to do it as a documentary, not even a doc, well, yeah, documentary for, uh, uh, for family and close friends. And especially my, most importantly, my kids and my um, my younger kids and um, my father's grandkids and grandchildren, uh, great grandchildren. Um, um, so, I mean, that was really the reason. And keeping the studio, uh, and then Jane and I were talking about when I, because we were always talking about when I do a documentary about him and. Um, finally realized we, we should do it sooner rather than later because of uh, his contemporaries who were in the, uh, the documentary. We were worrying about them being able to be interviewed and so on. So and then we got a hold of you, and, and that's how it started. But it wasn't intended to be a documentary for HBO or anybody. It was just for us, and then it evolved into that. And it was actually something that you had been talking about for quite some time. And I, mm. Jane Rosenthal is uh, the person who was really the catalyst in getting Bob ultimately to do this. And this is something that had been, you guys had been discussing for a while. Talk, why did you feel this story needed to be told? Well, when you, um, you think about what's important for not only our own children, but for future generations, you look at our culture and our cultural heritage, and that really defines who we are as a people. And I felt that, um, aside from my personal feelings about Bob Sr. and how kind he was to me when we first, when Bob and I first started working together, there was a whole generation of artists whose stories were going to be lost, and it felt imperative that we have that history and have a piece of that history and knew the key to it was Bob. Megan, you were, Megan was the art advisor to this film, make sure that we got our facts straight, which was really good. Um, she's also an art advisor in real life as well. One of the things that struck me in the process of making this film is, is everybody said that Robert De Niro Sr.'s, the final chapter in his book has not been written yet. It is a story that is evolving. Um, and it was certainly a story that evolved you know, during his lifetime in terms of the way that his art was accepted. 
and the, the, the struggles that he experienced in mid and later career. Talk to us about, put it in perspective for us if you can. It's, it's true that it is still evolving and, and we hope it's still evolving because we're still working on it very much. Um, he, he did have shows almost every year of his life, you know, with the exception of a few years here and there. Um, but it wasn't always enough to really to sustain him, and um, maybe it wasn't enough, as the film says, enough recognition to really fulfill him. I mean, I think what he wanted was what any artist wants, which is to be seen, to to be seen as a person and to have his art be seen and, and maybe even to be understood and, and to be known. And I don't know that that really happened for him, but it's, it's part of our ongoing work um, to continue to show his work in galleries and, and museums to continue to research it. And I think what's amazing about this film project, which you know I don't get involved in film, but it's a, it's a completely different way of storytelling from what we do as art historians. You know, we, we've, we're so focused on the art world. This brought it to a much wider audience. And, and the work that you did with Gita, researching through his journals and finding the way to tell the story in film was, was a, a completely new dimension. And um, the, to, to your point, mm -hmm. right now there is an exhibit in New York City. Um, and, and Megan, these books are? There is. Um, these catalogs are a catalog of the exhibition at the D.C. Moore Gallery, which represents the estate. Um, and they, they're paintings from the estate. They're paintings that we have found just in recent months in, in private collections. It runs through the end of, of July. So Bob, you are a kind of famously private guy about your personal life. This is obviously now taking a very private story and making it public. How does it feel to be experiencing it's, it's being broadcast? We're showing it here. How does, how does it feel to be? experiencing this with an audience? Well, uh, I, mean, I had to do it eventually. Um, I had to do it, so um, that's it. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, that's it. I wish I would have done it earlier, but I now, you know, it's, as I say, I was worried about Certain people like uh, Paul Rezica and Al Kresh and um, any anyone else we could find, though, though it was just Paul and Al at this point, right. I mean, um, who um, could, could reminisce about uh, their experiences with my father being his contemporary. So, and here we are. How about some questions from the audience? It's hard for me to see, but we've got people coming with microphones, so we'll start right here. Right behind you. Well, this is an incredibly personal question. If you're not in the mood to answer it, I know you just won't, so that's not bothering me. And it's a, it comes out of the film, and it's about forgiveness. Um, because it's pretty clear in the film that you still not, have not forgiven yourself for not getting your father into medical care sooner. And have you, and what, is, what are your thoughts about forgiveness and what it takes to come to terms and to move on? And what do you think he would tell you on that subject? Well, you know, my father didn't wanna, he was terrified to uh, get a, get, um, do what he should have done, which is a prostatectomy. Prostate, prostate, prostate. No, it's not prostatectomy. Oh, okay. It's prostatectomy. I think it's well, and, and added. I was corrected on this. So anyway, but I, he didn't. He, I always felt in hindsight that because I did it myself, that he should have. I should have tried to force him in the best way that I could to to go ahead with the, and he wind up being um, better than he thought he could ever be. Um, it was terrifying for both of us when we heard the, the prognosis, if you will, uh, um, when I was 40, and this is 30 years ago. Um, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's the only thing, if I could have, I don't know whether I could have, and I, it was just in hindsight, because I really, I tried when he was, um, 
you know, when the doctor would call me and say, get a hold of your father, tell him to go in, come, come to see me, blah, blah, blah. And it was, um, uh, he'd say, yeah, and this and that. And I didn't even myself realize how important it was. I thought it was just for checkups and stuff like that. It was more, uh, and it just progressed. Um, anyway. But your father was also stubborn. Yeah, he was. No, I, I in other so words, to get him. There are certain traits that run in the family. But <laughs> being, <laughs> being, uh, being busy also, and like, you know, and I don't, you know, to, Though I had, in other situations, gotten on him, I, this was one that, looking in hindsight, I would, have, would have been absolutely on him. Whether it would have really worked, I don't know, but it could have. So <laughs> I always have that on my mind. Um, where's the mic? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Jane, Susan Silver. Huh? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Jane was the youngest development exec at CBS, and she was impressive then, and she certainly is now. <laughs> Uh, Mr. De Niro, it was a beautiful film, very meaningful. You did your father proud. Um, I don't know if you want to answer this either, but um, did he ever find a loving relationship or peace with his personal life? Uh, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Not, not in front of me, he didn't. Yeah, so in, the, what he did. in the journals, it, it also doesn't indicate that he, yeah. that, that he did. It's hard for me to see, so whatever, sorry, go ahead. Hi, Gail Amsterdam. I loved it. Thank you so much for all of you, you and what you've done. I just lost my mother. It was very touching to me. Who took all the footage of the family footage, or most of it? Who took it? What do you mean? Who was, who, who was behind the camera taking pictures of your father? Um, well, there was a, a guy um, who in the 70s was following my father around with a Super 8 camera. And when my father passed away, I wasn't aware of it at the time. He got in touch with me and made me aware of it. And uh, so I, I got the, all the footage from him. I, I was reminded that I did pay for it. I thought he might have given it to me, but he, he didn't. But that's fine. Uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that was it. So I gave it to Thelma Schoonmaker, who's Marty Scorsese's editor, and asked her sort of like to put it in some order for me or whatever, and she did. And then I held it for a couple of years. I was talking to Jane on and off about what I have, and I looked at it and, and didn't know what to do, tried to show it to the kids who really didn't know what this was. You know, they look, you know, um, but in any case, um, so then we finally just did it and used, you guys used whatever was uh, relevant to the telling of the story uh, uh, for the documentary. That's where it came from. So there was a fan of his who followed him around with a Super 8 camera. Yes. Um, um, how do you think an artist can receive um, great recognition during life and not just after his or her deaths? Oh, that's a tough Moza? one. <laughs> How does somebody get the recognition during his life and not after? Ooh. You guys, I left that. Luck. Yeah. Yeah, luck. I mean, you don't. Some people get it in their lifetime and others don't. Uh. Yes. Go ahead. Right there. How large, how large is the oeuvre uh, that's um, in existence? And how, because it's so personal, um, how do you feel about the fact that it is being sold and I guess sold, is that correct? Some of so it how large and what's your thoughts about it, that it, being, it is being sold now? Well, it's being sold I, um, and it's always been sold. Uh, um, for me, as I said, I did the, the documentary just for me personally and family and very close friends, uh, especially the kids and grandkids and great grandkids that so document what their grandfather, great grandfather, father did. Um, you know, it, it, I, I don't know, it, it, all this stuff doesn't mean that my father will get recognized anymore after this. 
Um, my only thing, oddly enough, is that the more expensive the, uh, the paintings and artwork becomes, the more chance that they are, for no other reason, an asset to the people who buy them, and they'll protect them. And I want them to have a home. I want them to be cherished um, the way he cherished them and the way I cherished them. Uh, so that's it. But as far as value at this point, it hasn't, Megan will tell you. Yeah, um, I mean, there, there are a lot of paintings that, that belong to the estate. We're starting to discover things that are in private collections. We have a pretty good idea of what things are in museums. But you know, even in, in more recent years, I think we've had a lot of discussions about you know, paintings that should be held back, you know, that, that are either for the family to always keep, that will never be sold, or that might ultimately, you know, we want them to go to museum collections. And so we're, we're, we're starting to really shape his legacy in that way. But, you know, I think going back to, you know, his desire for recognition, you know, an artist wants his work to be seen. And so shutting it away and keeping it all together in an estate isn't going to serve, you know, the legacy, or certainly not the intentions of legacy that Bob wants to create for this artist. And so getting them out there and having people live with them is, is probably the greatest gift that we could give to this artist. Yeah, and I think, to, I think to that point, one of the things, and Bob says it in the film, is that he, the art world shifted during Robert De Niro Sr.'s time. And as Rob Storr said, the spotlight moved away. And this was an opportunity to let people experience his art who might not have seen it otherwise. So my sense is, is that this is, it's wonderful to allow people to be able to experience it and judge for themselves whether they like it or they, or they don't. Mr. De Niro, I have to tell you how much Howard and I enjoy staying at the Greenwich Hotel <laughs> and seeing your father's work Thank you. throughout the lobby. And I have to confess that I've taken home a couple of the coasters from the library. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and being an artist, I am inspired by him every day. Great. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Hi, um, Bob, I know how shy you are, so this is quite amazing to see you do this and uh, be public about your emotions. I'm um, curious um, to know whether the kids, you did this for the kids and the great grandkids, are they, what has the influence been? Well, it's, um, you know, with kids, they don't give you much. <laughs> 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 they look. <laughs> so, but I know it makes an impression. And, 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 and my older kids, yes, of course, Drina and Raphael, but my younger kids and their kids. And, uh, they're on the borderline, of, but uh, you just have to keep reminding them this is what it is, and you see it, and you know, and you know what you've inherited, and you, it's your responsibility to keep that going. And they, they know that. Kids don't always, as we all know, don't respond right away immediately. Oh, yes, Dad. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like... Uh, it's like uh, the kids don't say that? <laughs> it's like, you know... Like they act cool, they don't want to, but they know they know what the, what their responsibility is. Eventually, as they get older, what it should be. Yes, I know this is about your dad, but I'm curious about your mom. And did she ever paint again? And how did she feel about this project? I don't know if she's still alive. She no, she no, and I wish that I had. You know, she try and talk to me about um, things and her life, our family's life, my father, and I was busy myself, so I wasn't really, I say, yeah, 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 and I'm to myself, and uh, like my kids, you know, but uh, so, <laughs> so, so that's why I realized I wish I had done it earlier, but at least I did it, but um, um, she wanted to tell me stories about things, and, and we never had Conversations. In fact, probably she had more conversations with other family members, my cousins, and so on, um, uh, about little anecdotes and stuff uh, with her and with my father, which we didn't. A little bit we put into the film, and I did it. In another thing I wrote, I had written about family experiences and so on by somebody who's like a biographer. But, you know. We'll do a sequel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right here. 
Uh, yes, I'd like to know, is there any um, nostalgic or nostalgic memories you have with your father, any lessons you still keep with you today? Um, I can't think of any now, but there were. I mean, uh, he was... Um, uh, he was a loving father. He wasn't a he wasn't a father. That took me out to play baseball or those kind of things. But he, in his own way, was uh, very, as I say, loving. And then, and um, his intentions were good. And um, yeah, I don't know what else to yep. say. What was the guy's favorite painting? <laughs> Where is this question? Right back. <laughs> He's tiny. How old are you? How old? Five. Really? What was the question? <laughs> Can you ask me again? What was his favorite painting? <laughs> Why are you asking me that question? <laughs> I'm curious. He I don't wants know. To know I don't know what your favorite painting was. My favorite painting or my father's? Both. Yours. Both. Well, I, um, there are many, but I, there's one that, that I just became aware of recently. It's the woman in, yeah, the woman in, in red. red that uh, I like a lot. It's in, the, um, it's in the booklet? It's in the booklet, it's in the booklet. yeah. Um, and that's one that I would try to keep in the family for as long as I can. Uh, does that answer the question? My father's, I don't know what his favorite was. I wish I did. Hello. Uh, you have the journal and the studio and seeing how this is unfolding. And it's really sort of a, a work of art of how an artist was thinking throughout the time period. Will the studio be open at some point? Will the, his journal be used in a book in order to see this holistic approach to how art gets created? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, that's a good question. I, I don't know. If there's enough interest, maybe. Uh, maybe. I'm just dropping ahead. Yeah. yeah, I got it, I got it. <laughs> well noted. <laughs> Yes, where's the microphone? Thank you. Hi, Bob. My name is Maggie. Uh, I was wondering if your relationship with your father and your observations of his life and his struggles influenced your interpretation of any particular role that you've played throughout your career. Uh, no. There was some little things, but not much. No. That I'm aware of, unless it's my unconscious, subconscious. Yes. Uh, did you have a chance to uh, read your dad's journals while he was still alive, or only after his passing? No, I, I wasn't even aware of them while he was alive, and I haven't read them, only the excerpts in the documentary, and that's because uh, Perry had, and Gita had showed, shown them to me and said, what, what do you think of reading these? I said, I read them, I said, fine. And I, I, didn't, I don't know when I'll read his journals. I might, my, my kids might read them before I do. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure. When, when, when I'm ready, I'll read them. Uh, yeah. Hi, Bob. Um, my name's Ross. I, I really loved the sentiment of um, when your kids are ready to share something, or when, you're, when, when your kids are willing to hear something that you can share, um, that you should do that at that time. And I, 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 having lost a parent and having a new son, I'm interested in seeing sort of how you take your parenting now to share life before they, your kids came along and how that you know, feels from your father's perspective and that kind of thing. Does that make you, sense? Probably. Well, you mean sharing? Say that again. I'm just trying to... Okay. So I, I think in the film you said something about when your kids are ready to hear something about yeah. your life that you share that with them. And you know, I, I sort of heard it in my head that I wish I had done that with my mother before she passed, but right. how do I do that with my son before I pass? You know, and I, I guess I'm just getting deep. 
<laughs> well, well, all I say to the kids is that, you know, whenever you need to talk to me, I'm always here. I try and I reiterate that from time to time and say, you have, you know, not have you ask me. I'm here always. And I never say I'm not going to be here one day, but I will say that eventually. Um, but they have to, like, know that I'm there and take advantage of it because I'm their father, you know. And sometimes we have talks and this and that, but to get to real important questions about stuff, um, you would hope that they would come to you and try to get into some of that in, in whatever way they want to try and do it. That, that uh, it's probably not comfortable, but it's important if they can, you know, do that. We just have time for a couple more questions. Um, yeah. Uh, you touched on it briefly in the film, but I was curious, um, uh, as a struggling artist, to have a son that was such a successful actor, if it was, if he felt overshadowed, and if that's something that was ever a challenge for you, or if it was ever shared, or, you know, what your experience was. Yeah, probably in some way he felt overshadowed, overshadowed. <laughs> Maybe shattered. It was a slip. I don't know, but <laughs> overshadowed, uh, but also very proud uh, of me as I was of him. Um, but you know, you know, it's like a. I mean, it's like siblings who get jealous of each other, or anybody, you know, family members for whatever getting more attention or something. So, it's a natural thing. Um, it's you still love your sibling. Your your father, mother, this and that, you know, it's just what it is, but uh, it's all okay. I'm very grateful that you shared this movie with us. And there's an observation. It seems that your father struggled with his sexual orientation. And I wonder how much of his depression was caused by that. And I think it's really important that you share that with the world, too, because it's very historic. And now, as time goes on and same-sex marriage is becoming more and more acceptable, I think it's really important to show it as, as a historic um, phenomenon. And I thank you for it. Thank you. Um, yeah, his alienation, if you will, his, uh, um, I mean, partially because of the, the, the sexual thing and just because of who he was. And the combination of other things that I'm not even aware of brought him, you know, made him the way he was. And feeling as if he was sort of an outsider in certain ways. So I have to let that be the last question. Bob, any final thoughts that you want to share? No. You're I'm good. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.